Hey folks, I'm Darren with Thriven Astronomy. Today we're looking at this, the Sony 35mm f1.4 G Master lens for, unsurprisingly, Sony E-mount. This is a fairly recent and really well-regarded lens, and it begs the question, is this fast, fairly wide lens good for astrophotography? Well, let's find out together. So, being a G Master lens, uh, it is really well-built. Uh, you have, well, I say that, and then uh, let's say a decent focus ring. You know, there is a fair amount of dampening, but you have the usual fancy, pantsy things like that physical aperture ring. I like it. Some people don't. Here you got some nice, satisfying clicks and a little A setting where you can control the aperture through the camera. There is no lock switch for this, however, so you can't lock it in A or lock it in the manual aperture range maybe that's not going to be a deal breaker i certainly shouldn't think so here we have a declickable aperture so if you're doing some video you can declick it and get some nice smoothness out of it we have one custom button and an af mf switch and that's pretty much it for the external controls on this lens back element here with the bayonet we've got like a little thin rubber gasket. I suppose it would do the job. I, I don't know why they go through the effort of putting them in if they don't. It does feel pretty small though, but you know, it is what it is. Really nice hood. It's got the rubberized edge and you need to push this little button to release it. You know, that is why you're spending so much money on this lens. I guess I'm just kidding, but it's nice to have those little things. Here we have a 67 millimeter filter thread around a not quite 67 millimeter front element. That sort of begs the question, what's the vignetting like? What can we kind of expect here as far as astigmatism, that sort of thing? And I can't answer that by just holding the lens in front of the camera. Luckily I took some samples, so let's pop into Lightroom and see how this lens performs. Howdy folks, welcome to Lightroom. Today we're looking at the Sony G Master 35mm f1.4, very well regarded lens. How does it do for Astro? Well, we're going to find out. Here we've got a collection of samples here. As has become my custom as of late, I have messed them up slightly. So typically what I'll do is I'll take one set of track samples with the A7R Mark V, 60 megapixels for 60 seconds, give you a really nice clean image so that we can really dissect all those aberrations. And then I'll do a static tripod shot with a 50 megapixel Sony Alpha 1 and I'll give you a look at what things look like if you're not tracking, at least for wider field lenses. In this case, uh, this is part of the batch of, of uh, samples where I left my camera in cropped sensor mode. So I don't have proper samples for the Alpha 1. I just have like center crops or APS-C crops of that sensor. That said, they're still a little fairly usable. Uh, it'll give you an idea what the star trailing is like. So we'll still look at those. But for these other samples, the tracked samples, Sony A7R Mark V tracked on the Fornax Mounts Light Track 2 for 60 seconds. Permanent Astronomy is Fornax Mounts North American distributor. So if you're interested in a bomb proof portable star tracker, by all means, head on over to fervastronomy.com and take a look see. That being said, uh, let's take a little look at some of these samples here. And uh, oh, before I do that, I do want to mention ISO and ISO invariance. You've heard this before if you've seen one of these reviews, but all the A7R Mark V shots are done at 320. The Alpha 1, however, is at ISO 500. Why do I do this? Well, something called ISO invariance or ISO invariance. This is sensor specific. It's not in every camera and it's not the same between cameras that uh, work this way, but in a lot of modern cameras, there's really only in a lot of cases two quote unquote real ISO analog amplification stages, usually 100. And in the case of the A7R Mark V, ISO 320. That means that every ISO above 320 is basically fake. It's just digital. The camera's boosting the exposure digitally afterwards, which boosts all of the associated read noise, and we don't want that. So what do we do? We shoot at 320, and we get basically the same no noise performance. We get the same ability to raise the shadows, but we also, by virtue of quote-unquote underexposing, we retain more detail in the highlights. Now, for these samples, it's not going to make a difference, but for bright stars, galaxy cores, star-forming regions and nebulae, you can easily blow those out and 
if you shot at ISO 35, 3200 or something like that, you can't always bring that detail back. Then you have to overshoot, shoot underexposed, and you have to you know smush them together. And why bother when you might be able to get away with getting everything in one image, getting more dynamic range? So this is why I'm doing that because there's a small chance that I can boost the highlights and retain some information afterwards. Anyway, that being said, let's look at some of these samples. We're going to look at the F1.4 on the Alpha 1. So this is a 10 second exposure. So it is a little bit underexposed. Might have been able to push this one to 15. But if we zoom in, we can see that we definitely have some star trailing happening. So depending on your personal tolerances and the resolution of your camera's sensor, this may or may not be a big problem. With a lower resolution sensor, you might even mask a lot of these. You might be able to push it for 20, 30 seconds. In this case, they are here, but they're not viewable at this distance. This is a APS-C crop even. So if I zoom out, this is like what the full frame would look like. And star trails, not a problem. So you could probably push this to 15 seconds easy. So that's not going to be a big issue. I do see that there is some chromatic aberration. Pop in here at 400. Yeah, this is pretty standard, I guess, with a lot of lenses. We got this purple fringe. So we're going to talk about that in a little bit. So let's just jump right over to the A7R Mark V 60 megapixel, 60 second tracked exposures. This is f1.4. Here we look, we got vignetting. Not a big surprise. There's always probably going to be vignetting with most of the lenses. Here we have some. Scroll through some of the shots here at 1.4, 1.6. You can see we got a little bright spot here at 1.4. And it kind of evens out a bit at 1.6. So we might find that this lens is a little bit, say a little bit less work in post if you shoot at 1.6 without losing, you can see we're maintaining the exposure around the like mid frame. So we're not losing more than the center spot. Anyway, scroll through here a little bit. It's getting pretty dark towards the tighter apertures here at 1.4, 1.6. I think that's probably going to be a good sweet spot for exposure at least. As with a lot of 35 millimeter lenses that I've tested, there's maybe a little bit of loss of contrast in the center. Yeah, possibly shooting wide open, you might be getting a little bit less contrast. I just jumped the gun here a little bit, showed you the, the center without actually doing the preamble. But here we go. We're now looking at the center officially. And here we can see the tracking did a pretty good job. We've got round stars, no real trailing. We do have that chromatic aberration. And if we look at some of the brighter stars, we'll talk about this in a bit, put a pin in that. There isn't Oh, there's a little bit of bloating here. It might be like a teeny tiny bit of what's called sphere collaboration happening, uh, wherein I guess the practical way to think about it for astrophotography is the stars will bloat a little bit, but I don't really think that's a going concern with this lens. So we'll just focus on the chromatic aberration, which is the bigger problem here, and it's not even much of a problem. Let's take a look in the, well, let's take a look over here since I spoiled the plot. So you might look at the star and go, look at the coma is terrible on that lens. And I would reply, no. So this is a really bad manifestation. Here are some more normal manifestations of astigmatism. And what does that mean? Well, let's go look at this corner. Here we got a little bit here too. Let's just find a nice field of space birds or space planes. Oh, here's a nice one. This is, this is more, I'm going to call it a quote unquote normal example. So astigmatism is what happens when the lens can't focus a pinpoint of light into a pinpoint on the sensor. So there's two types, tangential, which in this case goes from the corners and edges on radii towards the center. And you're always going to find it aligned with that. Here is tangential astigmatism and this little blue point at the front that's probably coming from that. So this is the lens having trouble focusing light in this axis. What are the wings? Well, the wings are sagittal astigmatism. Sagittal astigmatism is a, at a right angle to tangential and it tends to ring the frame. It'll look like it rings the frame. In this respect, I know the little wings look like they're curving towards, but they're not along an axis from the edge to the center. They'll always be kind of crossing a T here, even if they are pointed one way or the other. So that's what's happening here. Astigmatism, not coma. Coma is something different and I don't see any in this lens really. Coma is what would happen if every star, according to brightness, usually is worse with the bright stars turn into a little bit of a triangular delta shape. It would get a fuzzy tail, either pointing away from the center of the frame in the case of external coma or towards the center of the frame in the case of internal coma. You'd have the bright star and it would kind of like misshape in a bit and it would have that fuzzy tail and every bright star would be exhibiting that and they'd all be pointed again towards the center or away from the center of the frame. That's what coma is. I don't see any here really. 
I see a heck ton of, of uh, astigmatism on bright stars here, but no coma. Practically, it's the same thing, right? It's an aberration. It's how people experience it that makes the big difference. And the way that these things can, can disrupt an image is by making the stars look bigger than they should. And here we don't have much of an issue. When it does become a big issue, what you might see is stars around the edges and corners look way bigger than stars in the middle. And it just might throw things off a little bit. In this case, even though there's some pretty wacky stuff going on, zoomed in at 400, I don't think that's much of an issue at all, especially not in the edges. If you're doing what we're doing right now, you're not doing looking at a picture correctly. This is how people look at a picture. That's astigmatism, and that's what astigmatism is. And let's take a look at field curvature. So we're going to come in the middle. We're going to note the star size. You can see star size okay, and we're going to teleport to the edge. And while the shapes change because of that astigmatism, I'm not noticing a ton of change in the shape of the stars, in the size of the stars. That's telling me that pretty much while there is that astigmatism, things are in focus here in the middle and things are in focus here at the edges. And that means field curvature is not really a concern with this particular lens. Field curvature is when part of the lens focuses at a different point than other parts of the lens. Often the center will be in focus, the edges will not, and vice versa. You can focus for the edges, the center will be out of focus. In this case, it's not a big deal. For normal, you know, regular photography, it's often not a big deal. But for astrophotography, if you got it bad, it can be a big deal because you can't get some of the stars to stand closer to you or further away as you would if you're taking a group portrait, for instance, to get everybody in focus. So, but in this case, not really a big deal. So let's flip through things again here, 1.4, 1.6, 1.8, 2, 2.2, 2.5, 2.8. I would say I would not bother shooting this lens stop down like this. If I'm going to shoot stop down at all with this lens, just from what I'm seeing right here, I think I would be shooting stop down to 1.6 personally. Let's see how things develop here in the center. So 1.4, 1.6, 1.8 f2 at this point and it could just be a result of us not getting as much exposure we are resolving some of that chromatic aberration but i don't think this is an effective way to do that you can see from the navigator that the corners are still quite dark so it's not even giving us a benefit for vignetting so i don't think we want to be stopping down like this if anything i think 1.6 is going to be the ticket let's take a look in the corners and see what we got here so 1.4 1.6 eh, pretty much indistinguishable i don't think there's a big deal here 1.8 again we're not gaining much the the astigmatism isn't really resolving so that's 1.8 f2 astigmatism isn't resolving again i don't think we want to be stopping down like this at 1.4 1.6 it's virtually identical if you watch the navigator you can see when we stop down that, that little bit it's getting rid of that hot spot in the middle which again yes you're losing a little bit of light but i think it might be the best thing overall so far, my vote is for f1.6 with this lens, but 1.4 is totally usable. Let's go take a look at the develop module and see what we can see there. Just come down here to our profile corrections. So we're at f1.4, zoom in here on some of this chromatic aberration, click the button and nothing happens because it never does. Go over to the manual, grab our little defringe eyedropper, click and boom, fixed. That's as hard as that has to be. Yeah, overall, this is still here a little bit blue, but that's to be expected because you just got a little bit more wonkiness happening here. But that purple is definitely fixed. So that's not too bad. Next, let's look at the profile correction. So click, boom. So a little bit of that vignetting is getting cleared up. But you know what? There's still some happening here. There's still some dark in the corners. Hmm. This is where you're going to have to come in and do a little bit more work. Although. I don't know if I would call it work necessarily. Just doing a little bit of a slider, but overall, mm, profile's not perfect, but it's still reasonably easy to deal with. That being said, if we flip this on and off a couple of times, you see that there are some distortion corrections. And this is pretty interesting. I think this lens has pincushion distortion, but it's real subtle. It's almost as if the center of the frame is more or less what's considered the flat plane because i don't see the center really having any corrections happening at all but everything around it does appear to be 
uh, experiencing geometrical correction. So I think there's pin cushion pretty much everywhere, except the center is flat a little bit. And as we do that geometric correction, it's pulling this, this part of the frame out towards us, basically, to bring it in line with the center. We do lose a little bit of the edges and corners there, but just a smidge. Do you see how it's kind of bowed out a little bit? We're losing just a smidge of that. We'll just flip that on and off so you can see. So we are losing a bit of the top and bottom of the frame, barely any of the edges here. The corners are like staying in the exact same spot. That's weird or interesting. I don't know that I've ever seen a lens where the center of the frame is flat and the rest of the frame has to get pulled out towards the viewer. Is this even qualify as pincushion distortion? <laughs> I don't know. Weird. Luckily, we don't lose too much of a field of view here uh, and exactly zero field of view diagonally when we do this. So I don't think this is going to be an issue and I would highly recommend doing it. It doesn't completely resolve the vignetting, but it does a, a fairly decent job. But in that case, yeah, your I think your major decision is whether you should shoot at f1.4, f1.6. In any case, the image at 1.4 is pretty easy to deal with. The 1.6 image is going to be even more so. So as with all things, dear viewer, I leave it up to you. So was that up to your expectations? I guess I personally kind of like hoped for a little bit better, but also this is sort of vindicating in a way because I think that uh, where it sits at f1.4, it's a pretty great lens, but you can get, you know, the Sigma f1.4 as an alternative to it, and then the Sigma f1.2 as an upgrade to it. And I don't want to spoil anything, but the Sigma f1.2 All in all, I think this lens has its place, and I think it kind of fits in its place. That's just my opinion, though. I'm just a messenger. I'm here providing the samples, so... If you are looking at purchasing this lens for astrophotography, you now have the information you need to hopefully make that choice. So that's it. I'm Darren. This was Fervent Astronomy. Thanks so much, and hopefully we'll see you in the next one.